Today I'm going to be talking about some recent work that we've done regarding increasing wildfire disturbance and the carbon balance of boreal forests. Um, and there's just my name on this title slide, but this is very much a collaborative project with a ton of co-authors um, and those are their various academic institutions, funding agencies that have made this project possible. Um, in particular, this project was a part of above. Um, that funding went to Michelle Mack who I've been working with here at NAU for the last few years. Um, and at any time throughout the presentation today, please feel free to stop me and we can discuss things. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be completely formal, in which I just talk for 20 minutes and you have to listen. Please feel free to stop me. All right, so as most of you know, natural wildfires have really been the principal landscape disturbance in boreal forests for the last 6,000 years. And they're really the dominant driver of the boreal net ecosystem carbon balance, emitting large amounts of carbon to the atmosphere, primarily through combustion of these organic soils. And these organic soils, sorry, I just can't, um, can be meters deep in places, uh, accumulating over millennia with the typical stand replacing fire return interval of about 100 years. And they accumulate over these fire cycles through some portion of the soil actually escaping combustion beneath the layer that is burned. And that leads to a net accumulation of carbon from the atmosphere over multiple fire events and makes the boreal a net carbon sink. And we term these soil carbon pools legacy carbon because they are carryover pools sequestered over past disturbance cycles. And we can quantitatively define legacy carbon as any organic soil carbon that is older than the stand age at the time of fire. So you can really think of this legacy carbon that is locked away in boreal forest soils like a savings account. And the fires are like a withdrawal from your account. So if you're putting more money in your account than you withdraw, you'll save money. And that is what boreal soils have really historically done. Accumulated more carbon between fires than is actually emitted during a fire. Um, but what happens when we start withdrawing bigger amounts or withdrawing more frequently? In other words, what happens to this net carbon sink with the changing fire regime? And we're already seeing this changing fire regime. So this is showing total area burned in different ecoregions of the northwestern boreal forest over time. And this change in fire size is also corresponding to increases in fire severity, so more biomass being combusted in these fires, and an increase in fire frequency, so fires occurring more often or burning at a younger age span. And so we wanted to ask how this changing fire regime could alter the carbon balance of boreal forests. Specifically, we wanted to assess how much carbon was combusted and whether or not legacy carbon or that carbon that accumulated over numerous fire cycles is vulnerable to combustion. And if it is vulnerable, where it is being combusted. And so for this study, we examined fires that occurred in the summer of 2014 across an expansive and diverse fire complex in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And these fires burned almost 3 million hectares, an area about the size of Belgium. And people in the Northwest Territories had never experienced such extreme or large fires before. It was really the largest area burned on record for the region. And we sampled a range of sites, so from really dry sites with high drainage to mid-level moisture sites and wet sites with very low drainage that are generally underlain with permafrost. And these sites have very different organic soil depths with very shallow soils in the dry sites to very deep soils in these wet sites. And based on this moisture gradient, we had some hypotheses about where legacy carbon might be present and where it is likely to burn. So here I have proportion of the organic soil on the y-axis and on the x we have a boreal soil moisture gradient. And we expect the legacy carbon distribution to look like this, where legacy carbon is greatest at the wet end of the gradient in those deep organic soils. And that is really due to our expectation of what is combusted during a fire. So we expect severe fires at the driest end of the gradient, consuming almost 100% of that organic layer and resulting in no legacy carbon accumulation. 
Whereas in wet systems, low severity burning results in the accumulation of legacy carbon. And we therefore hypothesized that legacy carbon would be most vulnerable to combustion in these moderately well-drained landscapes because these areas harbor legacy carbon and are prone to moderate to severe burning. We also expected that under changes to the fire regime, such as increased fire frequency, that young age stands of burn forests would have sufficient time between fires to reaccumulate organic soil carbon pools and would therefore have more superficial legacy carbon and a greater proportional combustion of the organic soil, which in turn increases the proportion of forests on the landscape vulnerable to legacy carbon loss and becoming this net carbon source. So first we wanted to answer that first question, how much carbon was combusted? And we assessed both above and below ground combustion. So to estimate the above ground portion, we assigned each tree within a burn plot a combustion class. And then we used allometric equations to determine the amount of biomass and carbon combusted. And then to assess below ground or soil organic layer combustion, we use these biometric markers of adventitious roots on black spruce trees to assess burn depth. Um, and then we collected soil profiles to determine carbon content, modeling this carbon component of soil as a function of depth to estimate carbon emissions from burn depth. And so what we found was that in total about 3.4 kilograms of carbon per meter square was emitted. And you can immediately see that the above ground uh, component of these carbon combustion estimate is really small compared to the below ground component. Almost 90% of carbon combustion came from that organic soil. And these carbon emissions are quite large, oh, sorry, compared to mean annual carbon emissions in the same region over a longer time period, indicating that these fires were in fact very severe. Um, and another thing I want to point out is that the range of carbon combustion estimates we found were quite large, right, from 0.3 to 9.3. And so we wanted to know then from these field-based measurements, what is driving this variation in combustion? And what we found was that carbon combustion was primarily driven by moisture category, black spruce presence, and stand age. So we found that combustion was highest in these moderately well-drained sites, which is shown on that left-hand panel, where carbon combustion is low in dry landscapes because there's relatively little fuel to begin with, and low in really wet landscapes because these areas are generally under the permafrost and the soils are either frozen or just far too wet to burn. We also found that combustion was higher in black spruce stands, so that's shown in the middle panel, because these trees are really highly flammable and have a lot of needles and fine branches and they accumulate below ground fuels that becomes available for combustion over time. And that's shown in the right hand panel where combustion is higher in these older age stands because they have time to accumulate organic soils that then dominate the combustion. We then use this spatial variation in our field-based estimates of emissions to extrapolate emissions to the entire 2014 burned area. And that's shown here on the left-hand panel and then a zoom in on the right-hand panel. And on the right side, you can see that this model is really capturing significant spatial variability in combustion. And because we were able to use a relatively small spatial scale to do this, it was 30 meters, we're able to capture all of these small water bodies and unburned areas that in the past have not been captured in models of carbon emissions. And then we scaled those carbon combustion estimates to the entire 2014 burned area. And we found that approximately 94 teragrams of carbon which is equivalent to 50% of annual net ecosystem production or total carbon uptake in all terrestrial ecosystems of Canada in one year was combusted. So obviously a large amount of carbon was combusted and we know that these fires were really large, but in order to understand if the severity of these fires are shifting the boreal forest into a new domain of carbon cycling, we really need to know if this legacy carbon was combusted or not. So for this, we examined a subset of sites, so 28 sites that were older than 70 years at the time of fire, and that's the historic fire return interval in the boreal forest. 
um, and nine sites that were younger than that. So we can think of those as reburns or young burn plots. And so for each site, we took one residual soil organic layer profile and we sectioned them into one centimeter increments. So we obtained the top one centimeter, the centimeter directly below that, and then a centimeter directly above that organic mineral interface. We then removed the roots and filtered the soil and obtained the 14C or the radiocarbon values for each segment. And then we were able to determine the mean age of the residual soil surface sample by comparing its delta 14C value to the 14C value of the depth increment directly below it. And this is done by assigning them to the correct side of the atmospheric, atmospheric bomb peak, which I've shown here. And this bomb peak really represents a pulse in radiocarbon in the atmosphere due to above ground nuclear weapon testing in the two decades following World War II. So if the residual soil surface sample is less enriched in 14C, so a lower delta 14C than the two centimeter depth increment, we assign it post bomb peak. But if that soil surface were more enriched, so a higher delta 14C than the two centimeter increment, we would assign it pre bomb peak. And so this is how we can age it and we can do this because of the way that soil accumulates over time in a profile with old soils at the base and then they get progressively younger towards the surface. Kind of like how a tree puts on a ring each year, the soil puts on another layer. We then were able to assess the presence and combustion of legacy carbon by comparing the soil values to the 14C of the atmosphere during the year that the stand established. And we obtained stand age through tree ring counts on about five trees per plot. So we determined that legacy carbon was present if stand age is younger than the soil base and legacy carbon was combusted if stand age is younger than that soil surface sample. So where do we find legacy carbon on the landscape? So here I have plotted the presence of legacy carbon on the y-axis where one equals its presence and zero equals absent. And we found that the probability of a site harboring legacy carbon increased with depth of the pre-fire organic soil layer. So all plots with a depth greater than 30 centimeters harbored legacy carbon. We also found that the presence of legacy carbon varied with stand age where all but one of the young burn sites, which is less than 60 years old at the time of fire, harbored legacy carbon. And that dotted horizontal line really depicts our classification of young burn versus old burn plots. So surprisingly, almost half of these old burn plots distributed across all moisture classes really didn't have any legacy carbon. And we're not actually a carbon sink as we might have expected them to be, especially in those wetter sites, but were instead carbon neutral over past disturbance cycles. And we attribute the higher probability of legacy carbon being present in young burn plots to the younger age of the stand at the time of burning and not to the presence of older organic soil carbon. And so going back to our original hypotheses, these results really supported it, um, where legacy carbon presence did increase with those deeper organic soils, right? So anything over 30 centimeters. And there is even more legacy carbon when stands burn at a young age because there's a more superficial position of that legacy carbon. But what about the combustion of legacy carbon? So in terms of that, we examined only the sites where legacy carbon was present and we found that the probability of legacy carbon combusting really increased with an increase in the proportion of that pre-fire organic soil that was combusted. So when more than 50% of the pre-fire soil organic layer combusted, there was almost an equal probability of legacy carbon combusting. And all of these plots were at dry or moist landscape positions legacy carbon was still pr protected at these wet sites. We also found that it varied with stand age. So it only combusted in one of the old burn plots, but in half of the young burn plots. And that's because of the shorter time between consecutive fires, which really limits organic soil accumulation and results in this more superficial position. 
However, regardless of stand age at the time of fire, wetter plots were still resistant to legacy carbon combustion and thus were able to accumulate carbon over the fire succession cycle, even in this record setting fire year. So how do these results relate to our original hypotheses? Well, we found no evidence of legacy carbon combustion with that historic fire return interval or fire frequency. So it's not happening in the old burn plots. But with an increase in fire frequency or the burning of young age stands on the landscape, we did really observe legacy carbon combustion. And this was of course stratified by our moisture categories where legacy carbon was still protected from burning at the wettest landscape positions. So what is really the burning of young age stands that renders legacy carbon vulnerable to combustion? And I have depicted that here with fires burning into legacy carbon when the fire cycle is less than or equal to 60 years old. Specifically, we found that 45% of the young burn plots, so less than 60 years old at the time of fire, experienced legacy carbon combustion. And that equates to 0.34 million hectares of forest, which emitted 8.6 kilograms of Canada in one year. So in the grand scheme of carbon emissions, it might not be that much, right? But it really shows that we need to think beyond just the magnitude of carbon emissions and consider the source of carbon emissions or whether or not this legacy carbon is actually burning in order to detect these historically significant changes in carbon sink source dynamics. Particularly because the frequency of boreal forest fires is projected to continue increasing with climate warming and drying. And this will in turn increase the proportion of younger forests on the landscape vulnerable to burning, which will increase the loss of legacy carbon and the proportion of forests shifting into a new domain of carbon cycling from net carbon uptake over consecutive fire intervals to a net carbon loss. And this domain is not only a product of legacy carbon loss in the actual fire event, but also of that residual legacy carbon being exposed to decomposition and potential permafrost thaw associated with the loss of this insulative organic soil, both of which could further accelerate carbon loss to the atmosphere. And so accounting for fire frequency and associated legacy carbon loss is really important for assessing the effects of wildfire on future boreal net ecosystem carbon balance and its impacts on the global carbon cycle and climate. And that is all I have for today, so I'd be happy to take any questions or discuss anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nancy. That was really great. Um, yeah, so if anybody's got questions, please feel free to chime in. Hi, it's Anthony. It's uh, Peter here. Hi, Peter. Oh, I see Ma uh, Matt McCander popping up. Matt, were you trying to say something first? Or just you're not muted, okay. <laughs> um, so um, is it a correct uh, takeaway or am I over-interpreting um, your excellent graphics uh, with the, um, when the fire cycle is less than 60 years? Is, was that 60 year um, uh, revisit rate of fire uh, sort of the, uh, the point where uh, legacy carbon is consumed uh, to some extent and uh, doesn't increase uh, over time? Yeah, that's exactly it. So when, I mean, we, we just divided them into these two categories, right, of old versus young, but there was this threshold of about 60 years, that's when legacy carbon is vulnerable to combustion. Whereas if you have the historic fire return interval, um, we saw that it was still protected even in this huge fire year. Okay. So that was actually really surprising. We, because we originally we thought, you know, this huge fire, we're going to get legacy carbon that's burning all over the place. So it's kind of good news in that regard. Uh -huh. We often go to the bad news instead. Um, but yeah, the fact that it was still protected. Good. How well did you think that you're able to map like that moisture regime 
Yeah, I mean that actually was a huge issue with the with the global change biology research and the scaling. Um, and Brendan can definitely speak to that. Brendan Rogers more than I can. That was his kind of portion of of the the project. And I think that it's not perfect. That's for sure. Um, we use like a topographic wetness index. Um, and we, we still don't really have that great digital elevation model um, that I think, I think this moisture is such an important uh, aspect of it, but just being on the landscape in the Northwest Territories too, you can be, you know, two meters from where you currently are and it's complete, a completely rocky outcrop to a wetland within two meters. And so there, there's such fine scale stuff that's going on that I think that that's, that's really difficult to capture. Um, yeah, and that's definitely not my area of expertise, but um, I think that it still a lot of work needs to be done in, in being able to capture that from the roots. Could uh, potentially the soil, um, both the, maybe the topography, but uh, also the soil moisture uh, estimates that uh, we're hoping the science team will derive from uh, the LBN SAR um, flights would that help scale uh, across the landscape? Yeah, um, um, well, and we, we had somewhat proposed to do that, but we'll no longer be, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was that was kind of like a next step to really get at these moisture gradients and then how that relates to, you know, successional dynamics as well, because it's such an important component and, and future fire probability because this moisture moisture thing is really important for that as well. Well, there's a, there is a, I have, of course, have nothing to do with the selection, but the, uh, the, uh, there, is, there is another, there is another solicitation that should come out at, at you know, at some point for further uh, data, data synthesis and analysis. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Xanthi. I really enjoyed the presentation.